As the 19th century unfolded, the United States was ensnared by the Panic of 1873, an economic depression that showed hardship and despair across the nation. Financial collapse, bank failures, and widespread business closures darkened the American dream, leaving many to grapple with uncertainty and ruin. In this tumultuous era, Henry Hines, a man tethered to ambition yet beleaguered by the storm, faced his own battle for survival. Every asset at his disposal, including his home, was heavily mortgaged. More poignantly, his father's brickyard, a venture born from humble beginnings in brickmaking to a testament of self-made entrepreneurship, was also on the brink, mortgaged to its fullest extent. The situation worsened when his father was unjustly accused of hiding inventory from creditors, leading to his arrest. This period marked a low ebb as all his friends turned away from him and there was no one to get him out of the mess. Yet it was within this crucible of hardship that Henry's indomitable will took shape. The struggles faced by his father, who had transitioned from a brickmaker to an entrepreneurial owner of a brickyard, exemplified the resilience and tenacity that Henry would come to embody. This legacy of perseverance against the odds was the beacon that guided Henry through the darkness. Henry's response to adversity was not resignation, but reinvention. He saw in the contracted cucumber farm, not a burden, but a beacon of opportunity, a chance to innovate and transform. It was from the depths of despair that the seeds of a groundbreaking idea were sown, an idea that would elevate the humble pickle into a cornerstone of the food industry. Chapter one, the beginning. This is the story of Henry John Hines, who turned simple pickles into a ketchup empire and founded the H.J. Hines Company, one of the largest food processing companies. Now to understand how he turned pickles into a ketchup empire, we have to go back to the 1850s when Henry, just a nine-year-old kid out in the garden getting his hands dirty and selling what he grows to his neighbors. Pretty savvy for a 10-year-old, huh? His folks see he's got a knack for this and give him a patch of land to call his own. Before you know it, Henry swaps his wheelbarrow for a horse and cart. Just like that, he's up in his game, selling more stuff. It's like if he had a lemonade stand or sold candy. Henry was doing his thing, but with veggies. By 12, Henry's not just a kid with a garden. He's got a horse, a cart, and a list of people waiting to buy from him. Back then, growing your own food was the norm. But buying food that someone else made? That was sketchy business. People found all sorts of nasty stuff in food like lead and ground stone. So you can see why people were iffy about eating anything they didn't make themselves. But here's where things start to shift. The world's changing fast. Cities are getting crowded, people are making more dough, and suddenly there's a buzz about buying food that's ready to eat. Women are starting to work for wages too. Between 1859 and 1899, the food industry blew up by 1,500%. By the turn of the century, about one third of all the stuff made in the US was food. And guess what kicked off the trends for packaged foods? Horseradish. Yeah, that spicy stuff. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The main point is Henry Hines saw an opportunity in all this. He knew he could make food that people trust and wanted to buy. And that, my friends, is just the beginning of how a simple pickle became part of the ketchup empire. Chapter two, the horseradish. So after Henry got the ball rolling with his garden gig, things got even spicier with horseradish. Yeah, that punchy stuff that kicks your taste buds awake. People loved it for spicing up all sorts of dishes, potatoes, meats, you name it. Some even thought it could cure colds or whatever ailed you. But making it was a pain. Grating that root, mixing it with vinegar and spices, then bottling it up. And people were a bit wary about what was actually inside those dark bottles they picked up from the store. Henry saw something big here. He figured out what people really wanted was more time on their hands. Time they didn't have to spend grating horseradish. So in his teens, he starts bottling his mom's horseradish recipe, but with a twist. No cheap tricks, no fillers, just the good stuff. And he used clear plastic bottles. Why? So everyone could see exactly what they were buying. Pure genius, right? This move was a game changer. By 1861, Henry's horseradish business was booming. He made a whopping $2,400 by the end of the era. That's like 100 grand today. With that kind of dough, Henry could have bought just about anything. He went for his dad's brickyard. But get this, in 1869, he decided bricks aren't his thing. Food was where his heart was, especially with oil discoveries making his region an industrial hotspot. More people, more mouths to feed. Henry teams up with L. Clarence Noble, a guy from a loaded family, and they set up shop in a basement of a house that used to belong to Henry's relatives. They kept it simple at first, still focusing on that horseradish with just two women and a boy to help make and pack it. 
and for their brand, they chose an anchor as their logo, a symbol of stability and trust. Henry and Clarence were telling their customers, you can count on us, and people did start to listen. Chapter three, the secret sauce. All right, so Henry and his buddy Clarence weren't just stopping at horseradish. Nope, they were on a roll and decided to bring more players into the game. Celery sauce, mustard, and those tangy sweet and sour pickles. They were thinking smart, trying to use every bit of what they had, cutting down on waste and costs. Vinegar was a big deal in their kitchen of wonders. So what did they do? They started brewing their own, sticking to their guns about quality and trust. No funny business in their vinegar. Now, these guys were always cooking up something new. In just five years, they were playing around with horseradish, vinegar, cucumber, onions, cabbages, and a sprinkle of spices. And from there, they got creative. They introduced sauerkraut and pickled cauliflower into the mix. They even mixed up gherkins and mustard and came up with even more goodies. One of those was chow chow, a kind of chutney that threw gherkins, onions, cauliflower, and mustard into a party in a jar. The secret sauce to Henry and Clarence's success was their promise, their vow that what you saw was what you got. No tricks, no substitutes. Their anchor logo wasn't just a pretty design, it was a pledge of quality, a symbol that when you picked up a jar from them, it was the real deal. People caught on to this. They knew that if it had an anchor on it, it was something special. Henry and Clarence weren't just making food. They were building trust spoonful by spoonful. And let us tell you, that kind of reputation, it's worth its weight in gold. Or in this case, pickles and horseradish. Chapter 4. The Bankruptcy and Making of Ketchup So things were looking up for Henry and his partner Noble, with their business booming and all. But then, bam, the panic of 1873 hit like a ton of bricks. Imagine the economy taking a nosedive, money being tighter than a jar lid that won't budge, and there's Henry, short of $3,000 to pay off people he owes. Despite a bummer crop season, they couldn't turn their goods into cash fast enough. Then comes the real kicker. Henry bounces a check in November 1875. It's like watching a domino fall, leading to December when he and Noble have to throw in the towel and file for bankruptcy. But hold up, the story's not over yet. We haven't even gotten to the catch-up part. Henry's down, but not out. He's broke, sure, even struggling to buy groceries in 1876, but then ketchup comes into the picture and changes everything. Henry goes to his brother John and cousin Frederick, hat in hand, asking for a loan to start anew. And just like that, F and J Hines springs to life. They stick to the script, focused on the tried and true products that got him noticed in the first place. But the catch? Sales were dragging their feet. Now, here's where Henry's genius kicks in again. He spots the potential in ketchup, a beloved condiment since the 18th century, a must-have in kitchens for jazzing up fish, meat, veggies, and more. But there was a catch. Ketchup on the market was a hit or miss. Sometimes it was too cooked, spoiled, or just overloaded with spices that killed the flavor and look. Henry sees his chance and leaps. He leans on his rep for clean quality foods and introduces ketchup in his trademark clear bottles. He knew that if he could show people, especially the ladies doing the shopping, that what you see is what you get, he'd have them hooked. No more guessing what's in the bottle or worrying about weird additives. This was a game changer. Henry wasn't just selling food, he was offering peace of mind. One more thing he'd done unique was his marketing strategy. And the innovative aspects of Heinz's approach was his use of 57 varieties. The story goes that in 1896, Henry J. Heinz was inspired to adopt the slogan 57 varieties after seeing an advertisement for 21 styles of shoes on a New York City train car. Heinz was fascinated by the use of numbers to convey variety and choice, which led him to adopt a similar strategy for his own products. Heinz 57, Heinz 57, you have meals to plan each day, you and Heinz can make them gay. Get together right away with Heinz 57. The number 57 was chosen not because Heinz offered exactly 57 products at the time. In fact, the company already produced more than 60 different products, but because he considered a lucky number. Heinz cleverly integrated the 57 varieties slogan into all aspects of its marketing and packaging. The number 57 appeared on labels, advertisements, and even the company's iconic ketchup bottles, reinforcing the brand's message at every opportunity. Moreover, Heinz's advertising strategies were equally pioneering. He understood the power of visibility and appeal in marketing. For instance, Heinz was among the first to use billboard advertising extensively. One notable campaign involved placing actual pickle-shaped signs along train tracks, catching the eye of passengers, and creating a memorable image linked directly to the brand. Chapter 5. Going Global So after Henry Heinz laid the groundwork with his clear bottles of ketchup and other goodies, his company just kept growing and evolving. 
By 1905, the Heinz Company wasn't just a small operation anymore. It was big and official, with Henry himself as the boss till he passed away. He wasn't just about making food. He was all about making it right. Clean kitchens, top-notch ingredients, the whole nine yards. He even helped push for laws to make sure all food was safe and pure. Then Heinz decided to go global, setting up shop in Canada with a huge plant dedicated to tomatoes and more, running it all the way until 2014. Heinz was also big on keeping things clean and safe, even making sure the ladies working for him got hot showers and weekly manicures to keep things hygienic. World War I rolls around and Henry doesn't just sit back. He's right there helping out with the food administration, using his food wizardry for the greater good. And then there's the Heinz salad cream hitting the shelves in England in 1914, a big hit that kept him on the map even during tough times like the Great Depression. That's when Howard Heinz, Henry's son, steps in with ready-to-serve soups and baby food, which fly off the shelves. But Heinz wasn't just about food. They had this massive Heinz service building in Pittsburgh with dining rooms and a giant auditorium complete with a pipe organ for concerts right at work. Talk about a cool place to work, right? Then World War II comes along and Jack Heinz takes the wheel, turning the Pittsburgh plant into a glider factory for the war effort before moving the company onto the global stage, snapping up brands like Orida and Starkist Tuna. Fast forward a bit, Antonio O'Reilly's from the UK shoots up the ranks, making big moves and expanding Heinz even more. They kept growing, acquiring more brands, even diving into pasta sauce and snacks, always looking for the next big thing. But it wasn't always smooth sailing. In 2006, there was a bit of a shakeup when Nelson Peltz wanted a seat at the table, leading to a big proxy battle. And then there was some controversy over an ad in the UK, showing Heinz was always in the mix, stirring things up. The big bombshell came in 2013 when Berkshire Hathaway and 3G Capital bought Heinz for a whopping $23 billion, marking a huge moment in food industry history. Bernardo Hees from Burger King took over as CEO, shaking things up, including a tough call to cut jobs and ending a long-time partnership with McDonald's because of his Burger King ties. And then in 2015, Heinz merged with Kraft, creating a mega food giant, one of the biggest in the world. It was a bold move, blending two food powerhouses into one massive company, setting the stage for who knows what next in the world of food. That wraps up our journey through the incredible story of Heinz and its evolution from a humble ketchup company to a global food empire. What did you think of today's video? Were you surprised by any part of Heinz's history? Do you have a favorite Heinz product you can't live without? Drop your thoughts or reactions and any questions you might have in the comments section below. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. Don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you haven't already to stay updated on all our future adventures through history and beyond. See you in the next video where we'll uncover more stories that have shaped the world we live in today. Until then, take care and best wishes to you all.